We are still in chapter six, the final chapter of Pirkei Avos, of Ethics of the Fathers, and we're still in mission number six because this is the famous 48 ways to wisdom. If the wisest humans that have graced the planet have organized for us 48 different ways to wisdom, it's good advice for us to hearken and listen very carefully to what they have to say. Because if anything, these people are the world's experts in wisdom. And they laid out for us 48 different ways. And we're doing them one at a time. And we're up to way number 17. Bimiut derech eretz. With moderation of derech eretz. Now, as I mentioned last time, in the middle of the list of 48 ways to wisdom, there are six different things that are bimiut with limited. So we had last time limited commerce, miut schora. And like we explained last time, what that means is it doesn't mean to eliminate commerce. It means to have a little bit, not too much, not too little, the Goldilocks zone just right. A little bit of commerce, not too much. And that is the perfect balance to have a way to wisdom. Similarly, in way number 17, the one we're up to right now, limited derech not too much, and not too little. Now, what exactly does derech eretz mean? The word derech eretz means the way of the world. And that term is used in many places in our literature to mean different things. So, for example, the Midrash tells us, derech eretz kadma la Torah. Derech eretz precedes Torah, a prerequisite for Torah is Derech Eretz. In that context, the word Derech Eretz means proper interpersonal interaction. To be with people, to be socially proper, to behave in a proper way, in a dignified way, with decorum, to comport yourself well amongst other people. That is one interpretation of the word Derech Eretz. Previously in the book that we are studying, Ethics of the Fathers, we had the following Mishnah. Yafet Torah im derech eretz. It is nice, it is good to have Torah together with derech eretz. And in that context, derech eretz means a livelihood. It's good to have a mix, Torah study, but also the way of the world. Have a job, have an occupation, have a profession. Why, continues the Mishnah, because when you toil in both of them, you're toiling in Torah, and you're toiling in your job, in your business, in your occupation. When you do that, you forget to sin. So we have another definition of derech eretz. It means to make a livelihood. Finally, we have a third definition of derech eretz, and that is marital intimacy. So, for example, we just had Pesach. In the Haggadah, it talks about Perishus Derech Eretz. One of the torments that the Egyptians foisted upon the Jews was what was that they demanded abstinence from Derech Eretz, which in that context, it means a marital intimacy. So that perhaps is a third definition of this word, Derech Eretz, and it's interesting, if you look at the commentaries on this particular Mishnah, you see commentaries taking each one of these three definitions and explaining why that would be a prerequisite for wisdom, why this is a way to wisdom, to have limited moderation, not too much, not too little, of either one of these three things. A, interpersonal relationships, how you behave with people, how you interact as a member of a community or of a society. Number one. Number two, mating a livelihood. Number three, marital intimacy. Let us go through them one at a time. So the first definition that we have of Derech Eretz is how you behave with other people, how you interact with other people. And we're told that a way to wisdom is bemiut Derech Eretz, with limited interaction with other people, with a moderate amount of interaction with other people, not too much, not too little. What that means is that it is, on one hand, necessary, if you want wisdom, 
to be a member of society, to be someone who's interacting with other people, to be part of a community. And by the way, later on in the Ways to Wisdom, we read about how it's important to have friends and study partners and have teachers. Your pursuit to wisdom does not happen in a vacuum. It happens when you're surrounded by other like-minded people and you could grow from your interactions with others. But it has to be balanced. And too much of it, if you're too much of a social animal, as it's called, well, then you're going to be handicapped in your pursuit of wisdom. This is an interesting dilemma that people have to decide in their lives, you know, how much are they going to live as individuals and focus on, on what makes them unique and to be alone with their own thoughts and their own ideas and their own pursuits versus how much are they going to just join the flow, go with the flow, be a member of a society, be a member of a community and just do what everyone else does and kind of limit their role as an individual. And here we're reading that there has to be a balance, a little bit of derech eretz, a little bit of identifying as everyone else that's around you. Of course, it's imperative to choose a good environment, but not too much. You also cannot forget that you are an individual. And thus, if you're going to pursue wisdom, it's not going to be identical to the wisdom of everyone else. If you just mimic what everyone else does, if you just toe the line and go with what everyone else says and thinks, if you're not a contrarian at all in any way, well, then what really are you contributing? Is this your wisdom? Or are you just puppeting over what someone else trained you to say or what society trained you to say? And there is the need for balance. My grandfather, a blessed memory, used to emphasize this idea with his students the imperative of developing your own individuality. And it's a little bit of a scary thing. It's much more comfortable to be part of a society. Everyone craves that. We want acceptance. We want a sense of belonging. We want to be told what to do. We want to be validated by the people around us. And that's why movements are so powerful. Because it lets a person kind of remove their responsibility for their life. They kind of outsource that. And like we said, that's good to a certain extent. But if that's all you are, well, then you're leaving a lot on the table. So my grandfather, blessed memory, used to send his students to solitude. Go for a, go for a 20-minute walk. This is, of course, before cell phones and podcasts. Go for a 20, 20 minute walk and, you know, just, just walk by yourself with your thoughts. And for someone who's not trained in that, that's a terrifying endeavor. Just me and my thoughts. I'm spending time with this terrifying person who's also just me. And my grandfather once sent a student go on a walk. You know, the, you know, the yeshiva was located in a you know, rural part of the country. Go take a walk. It's safe. And a few minutes later, the student comes back and he's, he's all bewildered. He's all terrified. What happened? Were you attacked by a scorpion? Were there some stray dogs? Did you meet someone? Why are you so... No, 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 no. Yes, you actually, you actually did meet someone. And it's terrifying. You met yourself. And if you've never had that experience to meet yourself, to be with yourself, to be with your own thoughts, you're always with other people. From the day you're a young person, you have your family and you have your siblings and you have your fellow classmates. You're always around other people. You got your roommates. At the dinner table, there's always someone there. And if you ever have a, an open moment, you could read something. When are you ever with yourself? And when you are with yourself, it can be quite terrifying because you're meeting someone new. And this is why it's so uncomfortable. Not, not just because it's foreign, 
but because it's highly productive. It's very powerful. And we know the Yetzirah makes everything that can potentially be very beneficial for us, he makes it something that, that's a high bar to reach. He presents blockades. So if spending time with yourself is so productive, which it is, definitionally, we know it's going to be very difficult. There are going to be inhibitions. There are going to be hurdles that we have to overcome to do that. It's almost like a mathematical rule. To the degree of the benefit of the spiritual and personal development benefit of a given activity, that is commensurate with its difficulty. So spending time with yourself is very difficult, but very beneficial. Way back in chapter 3 of Perkyavos, we studied this together in 2019, which is hard to believe it's already four years ago. So I'll just jog your memory. The Mishnah tells us, if someone is up alone at night, or if someone is walking on a path by themselves, and they just think about inconsequential thoughts, they're not thinking about anything valuable. Someone like that is liable with their lives. That's what the Mishnah tells us. If you're up at night, if you're walking by yourself and you're not thinking about anything productive, it's a crime that's essentially a capital crime. Not in those words, but it's, it means you're guilty with your life. And my grandfather, blessed memory, when he interpreted this mission, he said that there's something really powerful about a moment of solitude. If you're up at night and it's quiet and no one's around, if you're walking along a path by yourself, that is a golden opportunity. It's an opportune time to make a quantum leap in your personal development. And if you squander it, you think about nonsense, you don't use it productively, then there's an opportunity to effectuate massive change in your life that you just ignored, you squandered. And that's really a crime in the words of the Mishnah, obviously to emphasize the point. It's a crime that's like equivalent to a capital crime because you could have changed everything about your life and you didn't. If no one's around, you don't hear any voices, you're not worried about what other people are going to say, that's an opportunity to spend time with the person that's most important for you in your life, i.e. yourself. And when you have that opportunity, it's imperative that you utilize it correctly. And by nature, we're social beings. And that has to be balanced with a bit of solitude. My grandfather, a blessed memory, used to say, healthy people, even though, of course, we like to be around the others, but healthy people also have a slight draw to solitude because that can enrich your life in ways that being around other people cannot. You want to build an internal life, not just a superficial external life. How do you do that? You got to build. Well, when do you build internally? When you are alone. You cannot build your own personal, spiritual universe from the community. Yes, you could get some guardrails, some basic framework. The scaffolding of a good life can be built with help of the uh, help of others. But what makes you special, you just copy this from that person and this from that person and this from that person. You're just mimicking other people. There is a degree of personal development that you are squandering. Imitation. And mimicry won't bring you to your potential. But of course, we flee from solitude. And it's important to have a little bit of a balance. Derek Eretz, again, in this definition, the way you interact with other people, the, the, the attribute of social interaction, it's necessary to have a balance. If you are someone who's always alone, you're a loner and a hermit, 
then there's risk of of you know hatred of other people get grumpy and cantankerous and uh feeling of superiority and that's very dangerous if you sever yourself from society and you live alone and you never interact with others that's not what is the proper way to grow either but if you're always other people and any moment of solitude is just painful for you then you're going to be empty and that's the balance a gateway to greatness one of them is solitude and wisdom, way number 17 tells us, at least in one of the interpretations, way number 17 tells us that wisdom can only be unlocked with some degree of solitude, but not on an island. If someone grows completely on their own, there's going to be something that is a bit askew, something will be off. There has to be a balance, and that's why it's for me, it's a little bit, not too much. A little bit of a social structure for your personal development, but not exclusively, that is a way to wisdom. And that was the first definition of Derech Eretz that the sages and the commentaries offer. There are others, other definitions of the word Derech Eretz. So, for example, we said earlier, it's good to have Torah with Derech Eretz because if you toil in both of them, you'll forget to sin. If you're always busy, you have your requirements to study, and you have your work. If you're very busy and you're never bored, that is a good recipe to avoid sinning. Now, the Maharal, in his comment to this Mishnah, he uses the definition for Derech Eretz of business or of work to explain what this means. Now, you recall, way number 16 was b'miyot schora, with limited commerce. And now we have way number 17, b'miyot which, tercharz, which also means making a living, having a profession, having work. So the morale tells us that there is a difference between the word schora, meaning commerce, and derech eretz, meaning work. There are two ways to make a living, of course. You could be a business person, an entrepreneur, as we would call it. Or you could be a worker, an employee, a laborer. And both of them are needed. Both are necessary in pursuit of wisdom. But of course, in moderation. What does it mean to be a business person? It means to be able to take risk and to be creative and to do something novel. That quality is needed for wisdom, and thus it can serve as a way to wisdom. But if someone's a worker, a laborer, getting a paycheck, doing something with their body, doing something with their time, that too is necessary for wisdom. I always think about, you know, the people who don't do any work in their house, can't change a light bulb, can't fix anything, doesn't know what an Allen wrench is, so I, I always try to do stuff around the house, not because I'm talented in these areas, but I think it's important to, to, to do it, you know, to be a little bit involved in, in the, the, what we would call, you know, menial labor or blue collar work, you know, building a sukkah, you know, that's the mitzvah that we have where these, uh, you know, visual spatially challenged Jews are forced to construct, a, you know, a, 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 a temporary dwelling place that's going to last and withstand the wind for seven days. It's a challenge if you're not so uh, handy and uh, industrious. It could be difficult. But here we're told, according to Maharal, at least, that doing the labor, doing work, not necessarily the creative type of work, the risky type of ventures, but being a responsible worker that too is a path to wisdom. If you think about it, you know, what does it take to be a good employee, to be a good worker? Okay, you got to be reliable. You got to be responsible. You got to show up in time. You got to write proper emails. You have to be able to work with a team. 
Those are kind of the soft skills that are needed to be a good employee today. If you think about it, to a certain degree, those are needed as well for wisdom. There has to be a certain responsibility, a certain stability, a certain grounding that's needed for wisdom. And just as an employee, you can't just make any decision they want. They can just come and go at will. They have to be subject to the business and to the boss. To a certain extent, that is also needed for wisdom. You have to have a plan. You have to have measurable goals. You have to have a, a certain degree of responsibility as well that is needed for pursuit of wisdom, but it shouldn't take over everything. A little bit. A little bit of that quality is also needed as a means to wisdom. Now, the most common definition offered by the commentaries as to what the words Derech Eretz mean is that it's marital intimacy. Miut Derech Eretz means a little bit of marital intimacy, of intercourse, a little bit, but not too much. Now, there is an idea that's very well established in our literature, that uh, too much of this uh, carnal pleasure is actually quite harmful. Uh, So for example, the Talmud tells us that Ezra, Ezra the scribe, the leader of the Jews at the beginning of the Second Commonwealth, he enacted 10 decrees. The Takanos of Ezra, the decrees of Ezra, And one of them was that someone who has a seminal emission cannot study Torah, cannot pray, cannot recite the Shema until they go to the mikvah. Until they ritually immerse in a mikvah, they're not allowed to study Torah, to pray, and to read the Shema. So, of course, that would mean that if someone is very busy in uh, in their bedroom life, they're always going to be going to the mikvah because he, he can't daven, he can't pray, he can't study, he can't even recite the Shema, which we have to say twice a day before you immerse. And why did Ezra do this? Why did Ezra do this? So he tells us the reason. And this, this may sound a little bit harsh. He says, so that the Torah scholars should not be always found by their wives like roosters. Roosters apparently have a rapacious appetite uh, for uh, procreation, shall we say, for carnal pleasure. And it's important for Torah scholars to not be like roosters. Now, you will be happy to learn that the this particular decree of Ezra was annulled. So today, if someone has had a seminal mission, they do not need to go to the mikvah before they study Torah, recite the Shema, or pray. But the principle that we see that Ezra is trying to say, this is something which should be limited, that is conveyed. There's a deep point here. You know, we're humans, and we always define a human as, well, a hybrid. Half an angel and half an animal. We have the instincts of animal, of animals, and we can descend to the spiritual lows of animals. But we also have the capacity for higher reasoning and for the intellect and the and the spiritual acuity to become like an angel and to overcome those animalistic tendencies. We have our instincts and we have the things that we want from a physical perspective, but we can overcome that and we can elevate above that. When Ezra tells us that humans and Torah scholars should not be roosters, he's telling us that in this area, we have the capacity or even the tendency to slide into animal-like behavior. Animals are governed by instinct. And that instinct, amongst uh, other areas, it means the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of procreation, the pursuit of mating, the pursuit of physical and carnal pleasure. And to not be restrained 
in any way, to not be limited in any way, to not be controlled in any way. And of course, we, we call that hedonism. Society recognizes that, you know, there, there is the capacity, humans have the capacity to be totally swept away by pursuit of pleasure. And that's what we are encouraged to avoid. So that's the decree of Ezra. Now, there's a very famous and relevant essay by Ramban in the beginning of Parshas Kedoshim, so towards the end of Leviticus, chapter 22 or so of Leviticus, the book or the, the Parsha starts off by saying, Kedoshim to you, you should be holy. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be holy? It's kind of hard to define what that means. So the Rabban has a very famous essay about this. And he says, he says, well, the Torah has all sorts of laws that are very well defined. All the foods you're allowed to eat and all the foods that are non-kosher, you cannot eat. And all the forbidden relationships that immediately precede that in the Torah at the end of uh, Parshas Achremos, you have all the forbidden sexual relationships. So there are the, the, the kosher foods and the non-kosher foods, and the kosher relationships and the non-kosher relationships. We have what's sanctioned by the rigid rules of the Torah, and we have what and we have what's forbidden by the rules of the Torah. But what happens if someone just says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cross those T's and dot the I's and follow the letter of the law and obey everything that the Torah tells us, but I'll still be a heathen. By strict biblical law, a man can have as many wives as he wants. Of course, today it's no longer practiced. For a thousand years it hasn't been practiced. But what if someone says, yeah, I'll marry a hundred women. And they're all my wives. And it's all kosher. Or I'll have steak, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and just wash it down with wine. I'll always be drunk, and I'll become a glutton. And it's all 100% kosher, the highest level of kosher certification. Says the Ramban, there is the capacity for someone to be a heathen with the stamp of approval of the Torah. Novel Berushos Torah, in his words, you'll be a heathen, a glutton, and it's all permitted by the Torah. To tell us that someone like that is missing the message of the Torah, we have the verse, be holy. Meaning that even in the things that are permitted, you should have some degree of restraint. And he quotes Ezra, that the Torah scholars should not be like roosters. And he quotes what our sages tell us about wine. If you just are always drinking and always have a little buzz, that's, again, missing the point, even if the wine's kosher. And it goes through many examples of how someone can live within the letter of the law and still be someone who's missing the message, the overarching message, and that is that these laws are there to limit, to mitigate, so to speak, a slide towards hedonism, but to encourage, to live like an angel, to be elevated, to be spiritual, to deploy the incredible powers that we have. And thus you could still be a heathen even within the lines of the Torah. And thus the Torah tells us, don't make that mistake. Instead, Kedoshim Tiu, be holy. And this is again similar to this idea that we're not of the belief that any sort of marital intimacy is problematic. More about that in a bit. We don't have that opinion. We don't believe in abstinence. We don't believe that the highest level is to be a, you know, a, a monk living a life of austerity and privation. That's not what we believe. But too much for overtake your life, that is the danger. And that's the challenge, of course, to find the fine line between restraint, self-control, but not celibacy. We don't believe in that. Now, it's important to note 
that now that the verse does tell us Kedoshim to you be holy, a person who is a heathen is no longer doing that with the permission of the Torah because the Torah says be holy, i.e. don't be a heathen. But regardless, the principle is well established that there is a risk that we have. You know, we have the capacity for wisdom. We have the capacity to be like an angel. But we're going to be limited if our focus, if the pursuit of our life is the pursuit of physical and carnal pleasure. Now, our sages offer, just once we're on the subject, they offer us very good advice to be careful in these matters. And they tell us that if someone is too frivolous or too permissive or too profligate in these matters, it can be long-term and even eternally damaging. So, for example, the Talmud tells us the book of Sanhedrin, page 22b, a woman only forges a pact with the man who she is with intimately the first time. You know, what that means is that there is a degree of connection that a woman has with the first person that she is with intimately that will never be matched or rivaled by anyone else subsequently. And thus, if the person that she is intimate with for the first time is not the person that she chooses to share her life with, then the Talmud's telling us that there's going to be something missing from that relationship. There's some sort of pact, so to speak, that that long-term relationship will not have. On the flip side, and there are many examples of this as well, uh, but Joseph, when he was being propositioned by the wife of Potiphar, by Mrs. Potiphar, as we call her here. So the verse tells us, chapter 39, verse 10, that every day she was badgering him, every single day, and he did not hearken to her, not to sleep with her and not to be with her. So there's a redundancy, to sleep with her, to be with her. So Rashi tells us that the redundancy is to sleep with her in this world and to be with her in the next world. And this, of course, tells us that the Torah's position on this matter is the people who are with each other intimately, it's not just a one and done, no strings attached. There are eternal strings that are going to be attached forever. And that's what Joseph didn't want. Even though, of course, as any um, healthy adolescent, he may have had some sort of inclination for that. But his higher reasoning told him, Joseph obviously knew this, that this would have long-term consequences, eternal consequences, and Olam Abba, he'll forever be associated with this woman. In a quite a dramatic statement, again, to reinforce this point, the Talmud of the book of Psachim tells us that when there is a second marriage, so a man, he's divorced, a woman, she's divorced, they get married, it's a second marriage. In the words of the Talmud, when they get into bed with each other, there are four people in bed, meaning that everyone brings their baggage with them to a certain extent. Again, this is another way of saying that these intimate relationships are going to accompany you even afterwards. And that's, of course, it's imperative to be judicious and selective and smart in making these choices and these decisions. Now, again, we don't believe that this is evil or not holy or harmful or spiritually detracting. It's actually almost the exact opposite. Our sages tell us, the Talmud, the book of Sotan, page 17a, tells us, if a man and a woman are meritorious, then the Shekhinah is amongst them. But if not, if they're not meritorious, then a fire will engulf them, a fire will consume them. Now, what does that mean? 
So Rashi tells us that this refers to the, the marital intimacy of the husband and wife. If they dedicate themselves exclusively to each other, then God says, I want to have a part in this, so to speak. And thus the, the, the fire and the passion of the intimate relationship is where the Shekhinah resides. That's what our sages are telling us. So there's no greater proof that this particular aspect of our lives is not necessarily detracting from our holiness, but it can, in fact, when done properly, when the man and the woman are meritorious, it can be spiritually enhancing. It could enhance our holiness. And thus it is, in fact, needed. It's a necessary ingredient in our pursuit to wisdom, but in moderation. It can take over your life, and that would be a shame. That would be a great misfortune. I say this tell us that if a man is alone, single, there are portals of wisdom and of Torah that they are not able to access. A man who does not have a wife, our sages tell us, does not have Torah. Very strong words. The Talmud in the book of Yuvamas, page 62b, check it out. Don't trust me. <laughs> I always think that when they have uh, these speeches before someone, before a wedding, they say, oh, such a great Torah scholar. I want to get up and say, no, they're not a Torah scholar. The Talmud says, no, you can't be a Torah scholar if you're alone. There are elements of our development that we cannot achieve alone. And we have to have someone that we share our lives with in order to reach our perfection. But if someone gets too immersed, too saturated, so to speak, in the physical carnal relationship, of course, we know that's not healthy. And actually, it's not even beneficial because Studies show, history shows, our sages agree that if there's no sort of moderation between husband and wife, their bedroom life will be in decline. And isn't that unfortunate? Of course, we have the laws of Nida that help keep the physical relationship fresh. The Talmud, in fact, even says that. Why do we have the laws of Nita? Why do we have these laws that tell husband and wife they must separate for a week or two out of the month? Why? Because otherwise they grow sick of each other. And then you have this period where there's this withdrawal and suddenly, everyone's as excited as they were on their honeymoon. Again, the words of the Talmud, book of Nida, page 31b. That is why the Almighty gave us these laws. And of course, they're difficult laws because it demands self-control and restraint. And that forces us to act against our animalistic tendencies. But the benefit is evident and clear. Too much, it's animalistic. Too little, if you're just some loner, some hermit, some someone who is just not interested at all in sharing your life, you're closed up, don't want to share your life with anyone, you too are not going to be able to achieve the great path to wisdom that really you're here to do. If you're beholden to your desires, if you're subject, you're shackled to your pursuit of, of carnal pleasure, you won't be able to see things clearly. Your judgment will be colored by your addiction and biases. And if you have an agenda aside from just finding truth, well, for you, truth is inaccessible. And thus, we're told we must maintain control to not be governed by our desires. We know you think about it, how many how many great, powerful, influential people were humbled and debased because of this. 
How many, how many families get destroyed every single day because people cannot control or people fail to control their impulses and instincts? How many people make terrible decisions that they regret within minutes? And they have to live with the consequences thenceforth. This is an area, it's a particularly volatile area. And that's why moderation and self-control is imperative. Of course, we have laws that help us in this area. It was a big uh, news item, or it wasn't a big news, it was a minor news item, uh, like five, four or five years ago, when uh, a politician, shall we say, of course, we're, we're apolitical here at the Torch Center. We don't know anything about politics, of course. But there was a politician who said that uh, they never go for lunch with any of their female staffers or with any females unless their wife is with them. And we have laws. We have laws about seclusion. And we have systems that are there to separate the sexes. And people say, well, it sounds so backwards, and so antiquated, so primitive. But uh, history shows us and our experiences show us that this is actually very smart because the way these things work, there's a certain progression. And there's a little flirting today and tomorrow there's just devastation, destruction, uh, debasement and divorce and all the disasters that come along with such behavior. So we have laws, systems in place and we're very fortunate to have that. And once someone's privileged to get married, to someone that's a you know good person that's worthy of sharing their lives with. This is a central part, of course, of the relationship. And it's not something which is dirty or unholy, quite the contrary. But also we have the laws that keep it exciting and keep it fresh and preserve that, that spark. And all that, of course, is necessary to achieve wisdom. Way number 17, moderation in matters of Derek Heretz. We said that can mean a variety of things. And each one, of course, is valuable and useful. We talked about the idea of living as an individual versus a member of a society or a community. And you need a little bit of both. The imperative to have labor as well as wisdom, as well as intellectual pursuits and that balance. And of course, the most common definition of this idea of this Mishnah, Derek Haritz means the behavior, the, the intimate behavior Marital intimacy, that too, it must be moderated, not too much and not too little. And that is the proper balance that is needed to achieve wisdom. May we all be so fortunate. Of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.